Hey everyone, welcome to the Not Your Average Joe Show. Today we have one of the most extraordinary sales trainers on the planet with us, somebody I've admired uh, for quite some time. He's the author of Hyper Sales Growth. It's Jack Daly. Uh, I could run on and on about his bio, but it's, I'm gonna weave his bio and, and a lot of his credentials into the interview itself. If you don't know who Jack is, you are not gonna win to miss this episode. He is the absolute master sales trainer on street tested sales approaches for sales management, for sales people, for sales culture. You don't wanna miss it. We'll be right back with you. This is the Not Your Average Joe Show, where each week we bring you sales, marketing, and mindset strategies you need to get to your next level. And now, here's your host, international business mentor, Joe Soto. Jack Daly, welcome Ooh. to the show. Joe, it's a pleasure to be here. Very fun. Already. Ryan. I'm so happy you're here, man. I, you know, I know we're uh, we're just newly getting acquainted, um, but I'm not new to you. And I think people who, uh, you know, are in the sales world. I started off in corporate sales training many years ago, and your approaches, uh, your methodologies, your what you call it, kind of street test tested. Uh, actually, I wrote a couple different notes for different things that you call it um, for creating hyper sales growth. You're not interested in single digit. Sales, you say, uh, which is the title of your book, which I got to hold up because it's a fantastic book. I got it earmarked, underlined, underscored, read it now, now is the third time. And I've extracted a bunch of insights out of here. But give us a little bit of your, your backstory, your background, um, because I don't think I could do it justice. Your biography is from here to the moon, uh, over 30 plus years doing what you do and training sales organizations and then some. I can't wait to tell everyone the other stuff that you do, but let's turn it over to you just for a quick backstory and introduction of yourself. Yeah, it, let's do it as quickly as we can, but started selling at the age of seven in the market, charged twice the price of every kid I competed with. Couldn't understand why other kids were playing hide and seek and tag and nobody was paying them. Who would, who would voluntarily today stand behind a tree and be quiet um, and, and, and not get paid for it. It would be like time out today. Um, and, and yet that's what the kids were doing while I'm knocking on doors selling potholders that I made. And by the way, sold them at twice the price of every kid I competed with because they were all girls. And when the moms and grandmoms would come up to me and say, what are you selling? And I'd say potholders. They said, well, I got it from Mary and Sally and Sue. And I said, well, you know, you don't have one from a little boy because I'm the only little boy that makes them. So you got to have at least one, if not two, which one or two. And so I own the market. So that really turned me on to sales. Then we're going to fast forward between the ages of 26 and 46 years old, the blank sheet of paper times. I sketched a company on it. I convinced other people to join me and I built these six companies into national firms, extremely fast growing companies, two of which I sold to Wall Street. When I moved to California from the East Coast in 1985, I moved here for the weather because I'm an endurance athlete. I started the company with three other people and myself. 18 months later, all organic growth, no acquisitions. We had scaled to 750 people, 22 locations. Our first three years, we made $42 million in earnings. That's the story for those six companies. All similar stories, fast growing revenue, fast growing profits. And then at 46 years old, I lost my passion. And if that's the, big, the first takeaway for today, that is it. If you aren't passionate about what you do, sales is hard to begin with, damn hard. And if you're not passionate, I don't think you could be successful. Find your passion and pursue it. And so I pulled the plug and I exited my business. And I thought that I would take a year off and figure out what my next iteration was going to be. And all of a sudden the phone started ringing and people said, well, you're not working. So could you come and speak to my company? Could you speak to my trade group? Do this, this. And all of a sudden I found myself in the speaking business and I found my passion and I've been there for the last 25 years. In, in, two, in 2019, as an example, uh, I put 250,000 air miles under my belt uh, that year and visited over 30 countries speaking to thousands and thousands of people. And uh, it is so gratifying to see the easily implementable things that I teach, the, how they effectively work. So that's the story. 
Well, we're we're going to talk about a few of those things because I've extracted some of those things out of lessons that um, I've heard from you and also from the book. I encourage people. I'll put a link in the comments uh, shortly to get the book, but it's called Hyper Sales Growth. Um, and uh, Jack, you're you're an inspiration. I, obviously, I couldn't have introduced you like you just did. So thanks for doing that. It's rare that I do that. I normally ha you know give a big uh, biography and introduction, but you're a total rock star and. Um, I wanted people to hear something I heard in what you just shared, which is you walk the talk first. You were in the trenches first, building teams, building businesses, building sales, practicing what you then went on to uh, now have taught for the last 20 some years, 26 years, I think you said, um, because you've built hyper sales growth companies, six of them, you sold them off. You have now been helping companies and people ever since and being uh, helping other people get the kind of momentum and catch the kind of momentum that you caught because you have a lot of simple, but a lot of overlooked, a lot of, I think, uh, not being used strategies that we've got to wake some people up to because selling now kind of post COVID um, is this is even more important. So that's why I'm happy you're here. I want to dive into a couple of things. Um, first of all, this is also something to to under to know about uh, Jack. He didn't mention he is now since uh, turning the age. You said since fifty eight, uh, you 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 ran fifteen Iron. You you've been you've been you've competed in fifteen Ironmans. Is that is that correct? Yeah, fifteen full Ironmans. Um, and at fifty eight, I didn't know how to swim. And then over the next eight years, I did fifteen full Ironmans and about about sixty triathlons in total. Yeah, and 97 marathons? Yeah, uh, 97 marathons. My first marathon was 46 years old. Um, I ran one in all 50 states and all seven continents, which as best we can determine, there's less than 200 people on the planet to have done that. Uh, I've got three more to 100. And in November of this year, I hope to be in Athens, Greece, knocking out number 100 where it all started. Wow, and you've done this in the midst of, yeah, the Iron Man. Justin says you're the Iron Man of sales. <laughs> that, that, that's the tweet of the day right there. That is absolutely, uh, as uh, this person says, amazing. And that's right. Joaquin's from two, Norway chiming in. Two weeks ago, two weeks ago, somebody referred to me as the Jack scene. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, listen, uh, the, 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 this is that the personal achievements. Um, maybe top the professional because you wouldn't be able to do the professional that you do. You wouldn't be able to touch the lives you've touched if you did not keep your health in check. And I, and I just turned, oh gosh, I can't remember, I'm 49, but you make me feel young now because of what you've accomplished since turning, you said 46 is amazing. And I want to just thank you sincerely uh, for, for being an inspiration and, and putting, you know, giving me a reality check here. Uh, hey, Joe, and you go ahead. Hold, hold on a second. What, when's your birthday? Uh, my my birthday was uh, the thirtieth. Ah, of of July. Of July. So yeah. my daughter uh, Melissa is going to uh, is to turn fifty next month, and it blows my mind. Like I'm good with my age. I'm seventy two. Um, but fifty. How the hell do I have a daughter that's fifty? I don't think I'm fifty. Uh, so age is relevant. It's yeah, it's relevant, and you have the passion, the energy of of a twenty year old. So this is this is terrific, and I'm so happy you're here. Okay, let's let's dive into a couple more of these things. Um, um, and well, and before we do, I want to talk about you know, modeling uh, top performers and ideas for generating sales. So if you're just now tuning in, stay tuned because I've got a lot of rapid fire sales training questions I want to ask Jack, but. You've also, in the midst of this, um, overcome a lot of your own adversity, personal health challenges, health challenges by the people you, or you're, you that you love and sur are surrounded with. Um, talk to me a little bit about the mindsets that, is, that's, that, is, that it takes to overcome the adversity and then to do the type of endurance challenges and compete like you have while maintaining up until I think what last year you're 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 on like a hundred stages a year, or at least in front of a hundred you know hundred different audiences a year traveling around. What give me give us some mindset tips that maybe other people don't talk to you that much about because I think the mindset stuff 
you know, while it's it, it's like underlying in the principles of your book, it's not overtly sh shared and discussed. So I'd love to hear from you s some ideas around that for people that are listening. Yeah, so, so it's great on your part, Joe. Um, uh, everybody has their challenges in life. Um, and, you know, I don't want to cl lay claim to having a, a, a domination of them. Uh, 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 my high school sweetheart is somebody that I married. And Bonnie and I um, had 47 years of a spectacular marriage. Uh, but I lost her in 2017 to cancer. And, uh, and so that was a giant, giant hurdle that I had to kind of wrestle down. Um, uh, in two years later, I slipped on the last step to the ground floor and severed my quad tendon, which if I was an NFL player would be career ending. Um, and I rebuilt it back such that I'm back running marathons again and doing triathlons. Um, and uh, last year, about 15 months ago, uh, I was combing my hair and I felt a little bump up here and I went to my dermatologist and I had malignant melanoma. Literally, they took off at the top of my head the size of the palm of my hand, about an inch thick, and declared it cancer-free. No chemo, no radiation. But uh, just uh, two months ago, we had a, a repeat of uh, evidence right over here. And I'm now uh, on a one-year treatment program, uh, getting infusions every six weeks uh, for the cancer. And so, you know, I have dealt with uh, adversity in my personal life in a many, many different ways and not just those. Um, you know, if you do Ironmans, I can tell you this, I don't know anybody that does them that doesn't think about quitting somewhere along the way uh, of that journey. 140.6 miles in a day of swim, bike, run is not an easy journey. And so what is it that, that, that gets there? And so the most important thing that we have in sales is the six inches between our ears. You've got to want it. How bad do you want it? And so having your goals in writing and being committed to those goals, figuring out, figuring out what the hurdles are going to be and whether you're going to want to chew raw meat off the bone uh, and go after it. You know, I, I want to be Bud. I want to be going after Gordon Gecko. I want I want people telling me that I'll never get to get go to get through that cold call and that I'll never get to get that prospect. I love doing things that people tell me I can't do. That all is in the wiring up here. So the biggest advice I can give a salesperson is this: focus on that which you have control over. Focus on that which you have control over. And then secondly, make sure that your time is allocated to what I call HPAs, high payoff activities. When we go into companies and discover what's happening with their salespeople, more than 50% of a salesperson's time is being spent on things that will not win new customers or grow the ones yeah. you got. And so literally, if you're a business owner, you could double your sales without adding an additional salesperson. Let me put it to the, the salespeople. You could double your income if you were able to employ your efforts on the things that you have control over that are the most important things in that business. I love that. HPAs, high payoff activities. Uh, I, I get a lot of questions from people uh, that are students of mine, people that are followers of the show about managing time and schedule. I have a lot of children. Uh, managing a couple different businesses. And it's about me being able to control the time I'm spending on the HPAs. I hadn't called it that. Love that. Um, and you talk a little bit about some of these things in, in the book as well. So let's talk about some of the things that kind of stood out to me. Um, and I appreciate you sharing the story and the mindset there behind uh, overcoming some of that adversary, just, uh, adversity, just wanting it. Uh, you know, you said chew, chew, the, chew the raw meat off the bone. Like that type of ferocious resolve is not that common. And you have it, Jack, obviously. And, and I want people to, to read between the lines of a lot of things he's teaching here because it's, it's yeah, we're going to talk about some tactics, but the mindset behind executing on these tactics is what he just gave us. Uh, so you, you talk about modeling top producers uh, in the book. Um, how, how does someone do this if they don't, Maybe they're they're an entrepreneur and they they feel like they're a little bit more alone in the uh, in, in, in this. They don't have a lot of people to talk to, or they're an independent marketing consultant or independent marketing or business coach. Uh, how would you suggest that they go out there and model top performers? We don't have access maybe to an organization or to a team of top performers. 
that I always have access. Uh, that, that again is up in the six inches, right? Look, uh, I was a caddy at 13 years old and I thought I knew what the job was. Carry the clubs, watch the ball, tend the trap, tend the pin, rake the trap, all of those normal things. But what I realized within the first 10 days of caddying was the guys I was caddying for were living a better life than my dad. I grew up in a middle income at best household. I was the oldest of five kids. And I will tell you, my brother, three years younger than I am, never had new clothes because he only did was wear my hand-me-downs, right? That's the nature of the family. Three of my four siblings today in their 60s and 50s are delivering mail for the U.S. Postal Service. That's the family that I grew up in. And what I realized is here were guys playing golf on Wednesday and the same guy playing on Friday and playing on the weekend. And when they arrived, they drove really nice cars and they were recent vintage and they were living in houses with built-in swimming pools. We didn't have any of that type of stuff. And so I said, man, if I had to choose between my dad's life and these guys, man, I would choose them. But there's no way they would let me get into their office and pick their brain, right? I'm only 13, but they came to my office. You see, my office was the country club. Yeah. And they're going to be next to me for four to four and a half hours. And so I developed a list of questions and I asked them all the questions. How did you become so successful? You had to do it over again. How would you do it differently? What would you tell me to do? What would you tell me not to do? All of those kind of things. I want you to think about this. Imagine having me dogging you for four and a half hours around that golf course and you going in to a clubhouse for a beer and seeing a buddy and go, hey, have you ever had that daily kid carry your bag? Oh, shit. Did he ask you the question? <laughs> Yeah, I got to go see what that guy's doing. I interviewed 200 people over wow. a summer at 13 years <laughs> old and developed a game plan where I was going to go in my life. So here is the message. If you don't knock on the doors of people that are successful in your area of expertise, um, the only person to blame is you because we are open to you. All we want is for people to reach out. We want to pass on those nuggets. We don't want you to go through the hard knocks all the way through. And so get your ego out of the way, allocate the time, identify who you want to go after and go after them. Um, I have been modeling the masters my whole life. Here's what I will tell you. Then in many organizations, we have the president's club. We have the chairman's club, the very best salespeople. But here's the problem. And I've got a client with 440 salespeople and somewhere between 8 to 30 people get honored as winners each year. But every year, there's about a half a dozen of them that are in the pack every single year. Now, uh, they have the same competitor. They have the same product. They have the same price. They have the same service. They have the same economy. But these half a dozen guys are winning the battle out of 440 every single year. The only way that can happen is if they're doing something different. So go ride shotgun with them. Go pick their brain. Go out to dinner with them. Do whatever you need to do. Show up at their front door as they're about to leave to go out on their day and go in their car with them. Whatever you need to do. And by the way, if you're not successful with half of them, it doesn't matter. All you need is the other half that you are successful. It's a mindset. So much is right here in that six inches. Man, that, that this, we could just stop the show here. And that's uh, worth a million dollars for everyone. Thank you. Jack for that. That was awesome. Modeling, modeling the masters. And also the other lesson is uh, I now know where to recommend all my children who are approaching the teenage years, they, where they should be working. <laughs> so, <laughs> get out there on the golf course. In fact, my 14 year old was just asking me, where do you, where do you think I should find a job this next summer? Now and that didn't even dawn on me. That's going to be my answer. Well, Jack Daly said, <laughs> hey, Joe, the golf course. he just says it's a fun job. Just go out there. This is really funny. Um, <laughs> I, I spent most of my business years in the money business. And the reason I went in the money business was because the three cities that my parents took me to that were large cities, I looked at the tall buildings and there were names of banks and financial institutions. So I, yeah. I didn't realize they didn't have the whole building. So today, I guess I would be in the technology business based on that model. And so yeah. you know, what, what you have to do is you're, you have to get the sniffer in play. You have to figure out, hey, where where is the opportunity? Where are the opportunities? Yeah. Yeah. Man, love it. Love it. Okay. Let's, uh, um, Tamur says, I would love to hear some more from Jack about hiring techniques, sales reps, compensation, the skill of sales rep department from there. You do cover a lot of that in the, in the first half of your hyper sales growth book. Uh, you talk about culture and hiring and processes around that. What would be uh, maybe your best hiring tip for someone listening in or and or, you know, recruiting? 
Yeah, I don't want to throw the person who asked that question under the bus, but almost everywhere I go, people tell me how hard it is to find good salespeople. And I go, are you looking? And they're going, absolutely. And I say, show me the list. And they look at me like I just came from Mars. And I, what, what list? The list. If you don't have a list of people that you're trying to recruit, if you haven't identified the market to go after, don't blame it on being too difficult. It's like a salesperson saying it's really difficult to get sales. And I say, well, where's your pipeline? What's your, what's your prospect list? And they go, well, I don't have a prospect list. Well, shit, it's hard then. Uh, it's hard to find good salespeople if you don't put them on some type of a list. So the first thing you got to be, got to have is a list. The second thing is you, you should go and look beyond your industry because you can teach salespeople your industry easier than you can teach an experienced person in your industry how to sell. And the third thing is you've got to put them into a touch system. You have to nurture them. And I like two touches every month uh, for as long as it's going to take because we don't know when a good salesperson is going to come into play. But a good salesperson will come into play when life happens, that's the key. And so um, that's the first order of business is a list. And the second order of business is you got to identify the personal attributes and characteristics of what else is your industry. Um, I'm not talking about a job description for HR. Um, they don't sell. What I'm looking for is, uh, you know what, let's do it this way. Higher you know, the movie Rudy, where Rudy is he got no capability to get into Notre Dame and he's too small to play for Notre Dame, but does. I want you to yeah. imagine staffing your entire company with nothing other than Rudy's in the sales organization. Amen. Amen. You 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 hit on something when you talked about making a list. You insinuated that people don't even really have a hiring or recruiting plan. But you talk about in the book more about that, you call it backwards thinking, right? And you say, you know, do you have your goals written down? Um, do you have a written plan with specific activities is actually what you specifically say in, in the book. And I love that um, because, you know, we, we in, our, in our business, I've said to a lot of clients who need marketing help, I'll say, well, you know, just start with what your current marketing plan is. I just met with a, one of our actual clients today and they're marketing a online uh, or no, an in-person summit coming up at the end of the year. And I said, what's, what's your current summit marketing plan? And they just, we're not really, <laughs> we're, just, we're reaching out to a few past clients. You're reaching out to a few past clients. And so we had to start putting together a plan. So I love that because how many people listening in terms of sales and, and uh, uh, business development are lacking a plan and, and really don't have real written goals written down or not writing down what they want, when they want it, uh, and, and they don't have anything to measure it by. You talk about what gets measured gets done in the book, but you, people can't measure something that they don't have clarity around. So talk a little bit about what, how can we motivate people to, to write stuff down, Jack? Watch this one. So the biggest takeaway I got at 13 years old in interviewing those guys at the country club was yeah. goals in writing, a written plan to achieve the goals, a system of measurement, and a system of accountability. I've been operating like that since I was 13 years old. And when I, when you were talking, I reached over on my desk for this. This is my daily planner. Now, I will tell you inside here are my goals for the year. By the way, these are posted on my website for the world to see because when I post them on my website, that increases the chance of accountability. I wow. also have five people that hold me accountable and meet with me each once five times a year, four times a year times five people, 20 times a year. And I carry it around in this day planner because every day I write down every single thing I did that day that relates to those goals that are in there. And then at the end of every month, I have my HPAs of my life and month by month tracking. And if I want, I can look at where I was last year for a year to year, month to month lookup. This is what I'm doing on my personal goals. Can you imagine what it's like on my business? Things that get measured get done. And that's the intensity that I'm looking for with my salespeople and my sales organization. Too many people say, hey, I want to be successful. Are you willing to pay the price to be successful? And one last thing on this one, Joe, um, I've been asked by many people about this process and I am so excited because in my publisher's hands is my next book, which will be my 10th book. And my publisher now has come back and said, this will be the most impactful book you will ever write. 
and it's a working title right now is called Jack Daly's Life by Design. And we're hoping to have it released by the end of the year. And it takes the readers through my journey of life and how I got to do what I did and as evidence. And then we take you through the process of the goal setting process that makes it simple to be exceptional. <laughs> <laughs> Very few people leave me speechless. This is awesome. And everybody's agreeing with me. Look, they're writing in the comments. Outstanding. Walk even in Norway. He says, this is awesome. Joaquin's in hell, Norway. Love it. Okay. I, um, I love it. I love it. Okay. I got a little off track. One of my favorite quotes. I'm going to talk about my favorite quote. My favorite quote in the book is this one. He said, if you make sales, you can make a living. But if you make an investment of time and good service, in a customer, you can make a fortune. I love that. Speak to us a little bit about that. Uh, I, I have no, I, I have, I have no interest in transactions. Um, transactional selling is hard, and it doesn't give you a return on investment. Uh, that's going to work. Uh, I, I'm about relationships, and the key with relationship selling is this: when you care more about the customer than you do about the sell, you'll sell more than anyone else out there. That's it. That's simple. And you you say uh, also like following that, you said if it's better to be interested than to be interesting, let the prospect take center stage because you you kind of reintroduce the simplicity of uh, simplicity, but not everyone's doing it, which is ask questions and then listen. If you had a sum, you, you actually wrote, tell me if I got this right. This is how you know I read this book. Um, you write in the book, if somebody asked me what the shortest sales lesson I could give, it would be ask questions and then listen. Four words, ask and listen, but too many salespeople get into sales because they're good on their feet. They like interacting with people and they show up and throw up. Yeah. No one wants to be sold to. And so quit selling, help them yeah. try, help them with their pain, help them with their pleasure. And the only way you can help them with their pains is to figure out what they are. And the only way you can figure them out is by asking questions. Last, last point on the questions. The person who asks the questions is in control. Yeah, brilliant. You have a, a chapter called "Half of Sales is a Head Case." Again, between between the head, and you talk about five laws: uh, this a law of self discipline, law of self responsibility, law of attraction, law of expectations, and law of belief. My favorite is uh, law of self responsibility. I remember reading. Uh, the six pillars of self-esteem with uh, Nathaniel uh, Brandon. And he talks about self-responsibility as a major part, obviously of self-esteem. Uh, it's been a, a cornerstone for the stuff that I've taught. Talk to us a little bit about um, your take on law of attraction, if you will, and law of expectations. I think you have some insight into this. Yeah. I mean, I mean they're two different laws, but if I take you the expectations, um, our life is a direct result of our expectations for it. I mean, we are what we think we are. You have to have that visual and believe in that. You know, um, as a runner uh, who's run 97 marathons, I did a lot of research in order to be a, of the running pile. Um, qualify for Boston. I've run Boston Marathon four times. Uh, that's the elite runner pack, right? Uh, and so when I did my studying of running, what I discovered was this. Until 1954, it was believed that a human being could not run a sub four minute mile. I mean, we just weren't built for it physically or mentally to take it under four minutes. But then in 1954, Roger Bannister breaks the four minute mile. Uh, you know, he, what he did that day was thought of for centuries as being impossible. And he did the impossible. You would think the guy would hold the record for the rest of the time. He held it for less than 30 days. Now, you don't think it was the Nikes, do you? No, no, no. What happened is every elite runner after Bannister went sub four went, well, holy crap, if he can do it, I can do it. Yeah. So what I've challenged all of my companies and myself included is this, raise the bar. The thing that holds us back more than anything else in life is the man in the mirror. We don't think high enough of ourselves. You know, I'm 58 years old. I didn't know how to swim. The Ironman starts with a 2.4, 3.8 kilometer, 2.4 mile, 3.8 kilometer swim <laughs> on the clock. Uh, I, I made it six years later into the Ironman World Championship in Kona. 
You know why? Because for 30 some years, I had Julie Moss's picture crawling across the finish line in Kona taped to my bathroom mm. mirror and said, I'm going to do that race until wow. you get it here and convince yourself of that. Then, then you're capable of building the strategies, employing the tactics and making it happen. Uh, you, you've really shared insight into all five of these laws in that lesson that you just talked about and everything else you've shared on this show. Awesome. Last thing on here. Um, I want people to, to seek you out. I have more things I'd love to get on here, but um, well, actually let's do two things. If you, you still have a little extra time. I'm good. Okay. So you talk about keeping things personal and I just love this because it hits home with me. Um, I, you're one of the people I, I learned this from. Thank you notes. You call you call uh, you call it um, every every salesperson, every professional should have uh, thank you notes, and they should have a money bag. You call it. Talk, talk to us about what you mean by that, and what you mean by keeping it personal. What can people do? Yeah. So the easiest thing in the interest of time is just go to YouTube and punch in Jack Daly money bag, and I do a full presentation on okay. that. And it's just a few minutes long. But basically, I have everything that you need to send a, to, to send a, no, a note card out to your prospects or customers in a little bag. I have my pen. I have my stamps. I've got my cards, all of that ready to go. But here's the, here's the real deal. Um, as soon as I've done a call, I take the person's business card and, um, and, and I put it into my contact management system while I'm still in their building and send them an email or a text thanking them for putting me into their day and reconfirming what we agreed on is to happen next. Um, never ever have a sales call end without creating a next action step, right? Then while I'm sitting in the lobby or the furthest I'll go is the car in the parking lot, I then take out my money bag and write in my handwritten personalized note um, identifying something that I discovered that we can connect on, whether it's fishing or drinking wine or running a marathon or what have you. And I personalize it, put the stamp on and stick it in the mailbox right in front of the building that they're working in. So they get this before I left the parking lot. They get the card the very next day. And by the way, what I'm doing is I'm playing with their noodle because what I'm typically trying to do as a salesperson is unseat the incumbent. And so one of the weaknesses that we have as a salesperson is we don't stay proactively in touch with our customers well enough. So when that person hits, gets hit by me twice in less than 24 hours, inside their head, they're going, holy crap, if this guy is this good with this, imagine how good he'll handle my account. I haven't yeah. even talked about the product or the price and I'm already starting to sweep the deck. And so the money bag is... That bag has made me an unreal amount of money in my life as a salesperson. And I, I, can, I can also tell you that I could sit here and work and tell you right here from my goals that I have handwritten notes as a goal, 180 handwritten notes this year. Um, it, it's, it's there and it's tracked and it's measured. And I can tell you how many I've sent already this year. Things that get measured, get done. Yeah, that is that is BA. That is awesome. You, you end the book, you talk about, um, you talk a little bit about this touch system. You hinted on it earlier. You in, you in the book talking about, um, you know, using obviously what's available to us on social to get in front of people using Facebook, LinkedIn, things like this. You just gave what I think is better advice, which is making sure you're, you're, you're giving an example of your high touch system, your, your touch system, which is you're touching them in multiple ways, not just for the hiring. You, you actually referenced it when you were answering the question about hiring new people or in recruiting, but also staying in touch with customers and following up. But you say, um, I love this. It's three words. I'd love to kind of end on this because it's so powerful. You say unseen, unheard, unsold. That's genius. I love that. That almost should be the name of your new book also. Maybe your uh, next book after that. Uh, uh, how, how, how about this one? Um, timid salespeople have skinny, have skinny kids. kids. <laughs> I've heard this one before. I love that quote. I say that quote. I think I heard maybe Zig Ziglar say that once, uh, but I can't remember. I love that. That's right. And you are I, everything I, I but first, timid, my friend. I, I first got that one from a guy that's in DC by the name of Devin Shane. And, awesome. uh, and, and Devin is a superb marketing type guy. And uh, every, every time we get together, uh, he's always got some, some takeaway to 
Uh, well, you have a bunch of them. You have a bunch of them in your book. I put a link to the book already in the comments, everyone. Hyper Sales Growth with, with Jack Daly. Go to Jack daily sales.com you got this new book coming out i'd love to have you back on when that book comes out if you do get it out uh here called life by design which i love unseen unheard unsold jack daly everyone jack thanks for being a guest today joe it was awesome really truly this, this was this, a lot of fun this is a lot of fun and, and a lot of lessons in here packed uh into the last 34 minutes so thank you so much everyone uh, next, next time I'll see you on here, but this, you got people who have been on my show for a while. They already know this is one of the best ones we've had. Thank you so much, Jack. We'll see everybody later. Tune in next week for the not your average Joe show with international business mentor, Joe Soto. 